by 1570, Spanish domination of European trade was hampering the ability of England to sell its wares abroad. War was a major problem in the Low Countries, where Dutch Protestants were in rebellion against Spanish rule. The blockade of the River Scheldt below Antwerp after 1572 impeded the export of woolen textiles. Mounting tensions between England and Spain augured badly for the free movement of English merchant vessels anywhere between the North Sea and the Straits of Gibraltar. England's merchants and mariners began to look outward in search of new markets to develop. In 1497, John Cabo had headed a voyage to Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. Then, in 1539 and 1540, William Hawkins had explored Africa and Brazil. English ships had also sailed around the northern coast of Europe to Russia, and the Muscovy Company was founded in 1555 to develop trade with the formidable empire of Tsar Ivan the Terrible. But these were episodic ventures. Under the rule of Elizabeth I, a more comprehensive effort was made to extend English influence overseas. The first years of her reign saw new trading ventures along the coast of Africa and fresh attempts to discover shortcuts, both eastwards and westwards, to the Orient. Other expeditions crossed the equator in search of the legendary southern continent, the Terra Australis Incognita. The Spanish greatly resented these incursions into their territory and were particularly alarmed by the seafaring activities of entrepreneur John Hawkins, son of William. Spanish settlements in the West Indies depended on slave labor. Their merchant ships could hardly keep up with the demand for captives from West Africa, the usual source of supply. Hawkins, as untroubled as any of his contemporaries by the evils of slavery, saw a commercial opportunity. Sailing first to Guinea, he purchased a cargo of 300 prisoners from local traders, then crossed the Atlantic to the Caribbean, where he found a ready market. On his third transatlantic journey in 1568, Hawkins' luck ran out. After disposing profitably of his human cargo, he turned towards home, only to have one of his largest vessels battered almost beyond repair by sudden gales. The fleet limped into the nearest harbor, the Mexican port of San Juan de Ulua. While crewmen and carpenters struggled to mend the damage, a Spanish flotilla arrived, bringing King Philip II's new Viceroy of Mexico to take up his post. Sailing alongside the English vessels, the Viceroy ordered his men to board and capture Hawkins' ships. In the mayhem that followed, many of the English soldiers were slaughtered. Some 200 survivors crowded aboard the nearest ship. Working frantically, they managed to ready the vessel and sail her out of firing range of the Spanish flotilla. But they had no time to take any food or water on board. Some sailors, seeing no other hope of survival, asked to be put ashore. The colonists treated them charitably, but the authorities brought them to trial as heretics, sentenced some to toil as galley slaves, and burnt others at the stake. Those who stayed on board the ship endured a nightmarish journey. Of the 400 men who had set out from England at the start of the expedition, only 70 returned in January 1569. Whatever vestiges of friendship that remained between England and Spain were now destroyed, although it would be nearly 20 years before the two nations engaged in a full-scale war. In the meantime, England was building more ships than ever before, and its new generation of sailors, who were both talented and ambitious, did not intend to let their rival dominate the seas. In 1585, Philip II of Spain had told the Pope that he intended to invade England. The Vatican did not trouble to keep its promise secret, and a network of British spies sent home frequent reports of Spanish plans. But even without this intelligence, it was apparent that England faced the prospect of a Western Europe entirely under Spanish control. In 1580, Philip had inherited the Portuguese Empire, along with its substantial fleet. In France, Spain was supporting a militant faction who were determined to exclude the Protestant heir to the throne from the succession. Farther north, Spanish forces were fighting to retain control of the Netherlands. 
When England sent funds and men to support the Dutch rebels, Philip interpreted this action as a declaration of war against Spain. Elizabeth would have preferred to have avoided war at all costs, deeming it a waste of human and financial resources, but circumstances now forced her to consider it. As an island kingdom, with nowhere more than 120 kilometers from a coast, England inevitably depended on the sea as the first line of defense. Henry III, breaking with the old practice of using only conscripted merchant ships of war, had established a royal navy with purpose-built warships and two royal dockyards to service them. Elizabeth added new ships and ordered the upgrading of old ones without relieving the merchant fleet of its obligation to come to her aid in times of crisis. To buy time, Elizabeth sent Sir Francis Drake, a cousin of John Hawkins, who had won fame through a series of expeditions of plunder against Spanish colonies in the Caribbean on a preemptive strike. In April 1587, he launched a surprise attack on the Spanish harbor of Cadiz, where part of Philip's fleet was anchored. The operation, nicknamed the Singeing of the King of Spain's Beard, destroyed 24 ships that had been prepared for an invasion of England and wiped out a substantial part of the Spanish forces' supplies. As the smoke cleared, Drake sailed towards the Azores, where he hoped to seize some of the ships known to be heading home to Spain, with spices from India and silver from America. The warships attached to the Spanish fleets managed to fight off Drake's attack, and he succeeded in capturing only one ship. Nevertheless, the Spanish suffered heavy losses of men and munitions and were further battered by storms before they reached the safe harbor. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and subscribe. If you have any other suggestions for future topics you'd like us to cover, please leave a comment below. And we'll see you next time on History Junkie.